about uh, algorithms for combinatorial pure, pure exploration. Cool. Uh, so thanks uh, for sticking it out until the last talk of the day. Uh, so if you you know don't know what these things mean, don't worry about it. Really, the you know talk, the title of the talk is you know solving discrete problems with uncertain data. And uh, so so the uncertainty here and the problems that we'll be considering will be you know very different from the previous talks. And uh, basically, the problem is the following. You know, this is the way I came to this uh, problem. So I want to solve the spanning tree problem, a max weight spanning tree problem. Uh, all of you know how to do this. Uh, so you're given these weights, and with respect to these weights, you want to find an acyclic subset of edges with maximum weight. Okay, we know how to do this. But now the problem is that I don't know the weights. The weights are unknown to me, and I have to learn them. And how do I learn them? So what's my model? I'm given access to a random variable. So for every edge, I'm given an unbiased estimator. Okay. And let's say that the weights are supported over the interval 0, 1. It's an unbiased estimator. And now I can take a bunch of samples. And at the end of the process, after I take a whole bunch of samples, I want to be able to output the, the max weight spanning tree with high probability. So at every point in time, I pick my favorite edge, I query it, and I get you know, one sample from there. And I can take a whole bunch of samples, so I can sample the hell out of this edge. I'll get a very good estimate of this edge. But basically, I want to find the max weight spanning tree with high probability. Or I want to find an approximate max weight spanning tree with high probability. So basically, this is you know, an exact identification problem. This is the PAC model. And these are the problems I want to study. And I want to ask the question, how many samples do I need? Okay. Is the problem clear? And this problem is you know, a generalization of problems that people have studied for quite some time. In fact, uh, people in this room have studied this for sure. You know, you've seen this under the stochastic multi-arm bandits problem, where you know, you're given n, n arms. Each arm has an unknown reward. Uh, you know, uh, uh, reward distribution. Think of these as the mu i's, uh, and uh, you want to pick the best one, the one with the highest uh, average. And what you do is you pull a bunch of arms, and then hopefully you can solve several problems in this. You can solve regret minimization. What I'll be looking at is the best arm identification problem. Find the one which is the best with high probability. And if you map it back to the previous uh, MST problem, it's a bunch of parallel edges. I just have two vertices, a bunch of parallel edges, and I want to find the max weight edge. Right? We're all happy with the problems, right? Uh, quick question. Uh, in the previous case, you know which edges of zero weight ahead uh, of time? You, you, your, is your graph complete or not? No. My graph, it could be a general graph, yeah. So uh, I, there are some edges that are missing, and I know these edges are there, these edges are missing. Uh, of course, I could put in edges with, you know, mean zero just to you know, mess you up. But yeah, it's a general graph. Other questions? And you know which um, edge you're getting, or which variable you're getting the sample from? Absolutely. You point to an edge, you get to pick it. So you get to pick it. Quite packed, but, but, yeah. I mean, it, sure, sure. So I'm using pack in somewhat more, you know, yeah. I'm using it only in the sense of being pro probably approximately correct, rather than the model where you're, you know, you're given, yeah. So you have absolutely no knowledge of the mu e for each edge? No, no. They're between 0 and 1. That's it. Yeah. Other questions? OK. So this is the problem that we want to study. And of course, this problem has been studied for a long time. It has applications. You guys know about the applications much more than I do. Um, and in fact, you know, there are books, papers by people in the room. I'm going to skip over all that. Because I'm, for sure, I'm going to miss a whole bunch of uh, references to you guys. Okay, but I'm going to tell you about some cool things that uh, you know. This is old stuff. Best arm identification, just this multi-arm bandit thing. Best top k arms. Find the best 20 arms. Okay, and this is this is stuff that uh, mostly prior work. This is the stuff that we were looking at, the combinatorial problem. I'm given some combinatorial structure. I want to find. You know, if you haven't seen matroids, wherever you see matroids, just replace spanning trees. You'll be very happy. Uh, matchings, so find the max weight matching. And then, you know, a fairly general problem, which I probably won't get to, uh, because I don't want to, you know, rush through things. You know, I'll give you a partition of n space. 
And I want to figure out in which part does this mean vector lie. So this is a very general problem. And we know some results for this. There's a nice open problem here. And you know, I'll end on the open problem. But basically, let me tell you just a little about this. This might be uh, you know, bread and butter to uh, uh, some, some of you. But they're cool results, and we can uh, extend these things. Well, I should have mentioned it right at the beginning. This is work with a whole bunch of people who used to be at Tsinghua, uh, Jian Li, uh, Ming Da Chao, uh, Li Jie Chen, and Ruo Song Wang. OK, so you know, here is the simplest thing, you know, uniform sampling. I just want to find best arm. So I can just sample the hell out of every arm and use the turn off bounds and the union bound. And basically, if I take so many samples, then I'll be very close to the mean. And then I'll find an epsilon approximate arm. So an arm which is within epsilon of the maximum with high probability. And all of you know how to do this, right? Now, can you do better, is the question. And one thing that's known is there's a lower bound due to Manor and Sitsiklis, and actually a bunch of other people, and I'm uh, probably dropping some names here, which say the following. So the lower bound is kind of nice. It depends on these gaps that we've seen before, even today. So if this delta i is the gap between the best arm and the ith arm, then the lower bound says it's like 1 over delta i squared times log 1 over delta. So if I imagine that the gap between the best and the second best is epsilon, then it's like 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta summed over all arms. So that's n. So this annoying, apart from this, this little n out here, we seem to be tight. OK? I don't expect you to uh, you know, get uh, this lower bound immediately, but you know, it's not very difficult, in fact. I have a proof sketch later on. But you know, this one should be clear. Please ask questions if something's unclear. We good? OK. So of course, one can ask the question, can you get rid of the log n term? And uh, out here, I was doing uniform sampling. I was just sampling each arm well enough to get a fairly decent estimate, so 1 plus minus epsilon estimate. Uh, with uniform sampling, you can't do better. No surprises out there. You've seen this before. But here is this cool algorithm. Some of you uh, will find this interesting. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull each arm. So I'm going to do this in rounds. I'm going to pull the, each arm mi times. And I'm going to look at the empirical means. And I'm going to drop the lower half of the empirical means. And I'm going to so I've half the number of arms. I'll do this until I have a small number of arms. And then I'll do just uniform sampling. Okay. And the reason why this works is actually very easy, and maybe I'll just sketch it very quickly. Okay. So let's say this is the best arm. And let's say that all the other arms, just for simplicity, are at least epsilon away from this guy. Okay? So once you take 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta samples, maybe 2 over delta, whatever, this arm's estimate this arm's estimate will not fall by more than epsilon over 2, let's say, or whatever. Okay? So this arm's estimate is pretty good. There are a whole bunch of arms out here. I can't hope to do a union bound. Okay? What's the probability that any fixed arm actually beats this thing? It's like about delta over 2 because of this kind of thing. Okay? So the expected number of arms that going to, that's going to beat the best one is about uh, 2 over delta. Okay? So the probability that n over 2 of these guys beat this is only like delta over 2. Each one of these is going to be this, forget the twos all over the place. Each of these is going to be the best arm with probability about delta. So you expect about delta of these guys to lie above. The probability that n over 2 of these lie above is only like delta. OK? So basically, this guy is going to lose out with probability at most delta in this round. 
he survives the next round, I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to half the delta. I'm going to proceed. Did that kind of make sense? So, you know, very simple idea uh, gets you the right number of samples, which is, you know, a total of the total number of samples is n over epsilon squared log k over delta if you're finding the top k. If you're finding the top one, that's log one over delta. It'll match the, uh, the Manor Sitziklis lower bound. It's a very simple, very clean idea. Oh, this one is due to Evandar, Manor, and Mansoor. It was extended to top k. And then there's been a whole bunch of work which has been trying to figure out exactly what is the right bound in the exact identification case. And this is the kind of mess that you get into. This is very close to being optimal. I'm not going to uh, you know, spend much time on this. But I've just put in the references. You can look it up, and, or I can tell you later on. Okay. So there's a bunch of stuff on finding top arms and top k. Was there a question? Good. OK. Uh, then maybe, you know, how do you prove lower bounds? You prove these via you know, change of distribution arguments, as you might expect. And uh, maybe I'm just going to skip over this part. It's actually you know, kind of simple. But okay. So let me tell you about how to extend these ideas to finding, let's say, uh, spanning trees. So again, the same problem you remember. Uh, there are means, and there are n objects out here. So in, uh, you know, uh, Usually, we, we imagine graphs with m edges. Just think of these as n edges. Um, the matroid constraints, as I said, matroids are spanning trees, or extensions thereof. And so we had algorithms uh, which uh, work for general matroids. And these almost match the things for best k arm. And so here's the, uh, here's the results you can get. And you can see, numerically, they look very similar. Basically, n over epsilon squared log k over delta which was the best thing for top k. And uh, for exact identification, there's again some mess. But this mess is very similar to the previous mess. So I think we're OK. OK. But here's the algorithm. I want you to take away the algorithm. It's actually very cute uh, because you know, it builds on this very nice idea of David Carter's. So how do you find a, uh, a, an optimal spanning tree? You know, there are many algorithms, but Karger's algorithm is one of the uh, most beautiful. So here is what he says. I want to find the uh, spanning tree, so let's just randomly sample half the edges. Okay? And recursively build a max weight spanning tree on this thing. Okay? And now you can use this max weight spanning tree on the green edges. So the, remember, the green were the sample, subsampled the edges. And I'll, I'll call these subsampled instead of sample because I'm sampling for my learning thing, so I don't want you to get confused. These are subsampled edges. I build a max weight spanning tree. Now I can drop a bunch of edges, which can never be in a max weight spanning tree. Mm -hmm. uh, any suggestions on which edges I could drop right off the bat? Green edges. Green edges for sure, right? But in fact, if there's some cycle, and this edge is the lowest weight edge on that cycle, I can drop it. Well, Tarjan's uh, red rule or something like that. So I can drop a bunch of edges. And the beautiful lemma, and if I want to strap for time, I'd actually prove this lemma to you. The beautiful lemma says that the expected number of edges you'll be left with is only twice the number of vertices in the graph. Oh, I'm assuming that I'm sampling with 50% probability. So actually, I, let me prove this. You know, it's, it's so beautiful. I'm, I'm a little confused. You said you Please. sample half of the edges? I sample half of the edges. And then you have an oracle that computes max spanning tree? Recursively on that. So I wanted to compute max spanning tree. Okay. So I sampled, subsampled half the edges. Okay. And now I recurse on that half. Okay. So I subsampled half the edges. I use my own algorithm, as in Karger uses his own algorithm to recursively build a max weight spanning tree on these things. But this might not be the global one. Because of course, this might be the cheapest edge in the graph. You want this, but you didn't subsample it. So he built something 
And he can use this edge to throw away a whole bunch of other edges. Um, oh, okay. Maybe I, I won't prove it after all. No worries. Uh, and so what do we, let's, let's do it. Okay, so, so what's the argument? So the argument is the following. I'm going to run Kruskal's algorithm. In my mind, this is only for the analysis. I'm running Kruskal's algorithm. I pick the max weight edge. And then I decide whether to subsample it or not. If this edge was being added by Kruskal's algorithm, I say, hang on a minute. Let me see if it's actually subsampled or not. Okay. So I pick the, Kruskal wants to pick this. I subsample. With probability half, I drop it. I go to the next edge. Right? And I keep on doing this. If it's added, then I add it to my uh, recursive uh, little blue graph. And if not, I just move on to the next edge. Now remember, Kruskal is going to add at most a vertex many, the number of vertices many edges to the graph. I'm subsampling with probability 50%. So really, I'm looking for how many times will I sample until I see the number of vertices many heads when I'm subsampling with 50% probability. That's twice the number of vertices. And that's the proof. It's very beautiful. And it extends to matroids seamlessly. Okay. So what's our algorithm? Our algorithm is very simple. It's you know, very directly inspired by this. Subsample is a subset of edges, maybe 100th of the edges. It doesn't matter. Find a max weight spanning tree over the subsampled edges. You might be making mistakes because you know, there's uncertainty out here. So we'll have to union bound over all the mess. Get estimates for the non-tree edges by more sampling. Prune recurs for the remaining edges. Okay. And the algorithm, you know, this is pretty much the algorithm. The analysis is very similar in spirit to the, uh, to the median sampling technique that I told you about. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. But the main idea was somehow this allowed us it gave us the combinatorial structure to uh, get the algorithm to work. Okay. Questions about this? Cool. So, uh, so this works for spanning trees. This works for these matroid things. But it doesn't work for matchings. It doesn't work for other combinatorial constraints. And so for some time, we were stuck on this thing. We didn't know what to do. And so. Uh, then we came up with uh, you know, uh, sort of a bunch of work was, has been done in this area and inspired by some other work as well. We came up with, uh, you know, we can come up with a per instance lower bound on the number of samples you need for a very general combinatorial structure. Yeah. So we'll, I'll, I'll show you this thing on the next slide. And then we, one can come up with a sampling algorithm which has a complexity which looks like this. Okay. So what's, uh, what are the various terms? This is the lower bound that we came up with. This is the confidence parameter. This is uh, the gap between the best and the next best structure. And this is the number of objects that we're looking at. So if it was spanning trees, this would be exponential in n. But you know, we can show that this is required in the worst case. Um, so yeah, it's required in the worst case. This is a sampling algorithm. This is just a sample complexity uh, result. This is not a polytime algorithm. I can make this polytime for some special cases, but I won't have time today to tell you about it. So basically, I'm going to tell you more or less only about the lower bound, and then we'll wrap up in the. Sorry, what was yeah. F? So F is the, so I have this underlying combinatorial structure. So think of this as the number of spanning trees or the number of matchings. Uh, yeah. So this is for any combinatorial, abstract combinatorial structure. Okay. And the idea is the following. Sorry, the, the font's not very clear. I want to minimize tau is the number of samples. So I want to minimize the total number of samples I take such that if I look at the optimal, and I look at its mean, and I look at any other set, and I look at its mean, then 1 over tau i 
basically in the symmetric difference between these two sets, I must take enough samples. So one over tau i, you know, th this is saying that the tau i must be large enough. And this is true for every set which is not the optimum. I mean, if it's the optimum, then this is a trivial bound. And this lower bound, so this is what we show, that any algorithm that succeeds with probability 1 minus delta requires so many samples and expectation. And the, you know, the proof is not very surprising. Once you come up with this idea, the proof is not very surprising. Basically, you take any algorithm that succeeds with this probability, let ni be the expected number of samples that this algorithm takes, and then you show that this, the, this resulting solution, the resulting uh, values form a solution to this thing. And the argument is, again, a change of distribution argument. What happens if I change the, uh, the, the means of these set of arms from this to this? Okay. Um, and the, once you write this lemma, so this says, if you can solve this, uh, if you can solve this uh, convex program, this is a convex program. If you can solve this, then uh, you have a lower bound on the number of samples you need. So of course, the challenge is, well, get an upper bound which matches this lower bound up to some fudge factors. Santosh, you look like you have a question. You just mentioned that at least one fudge factor is unavoidable, the log of the Yes, set. yes. So sorry, so what are the stated uh, gap? What's the gap? Uh, uh, the gap. The best possible upper bound is this. The best possible uh, upper bound is this times, uh, times this log f. Uh, and then there's the log one over delta, but that's uh, essential. And there's some log log terms that are coming. So your sampling bound is already optimal, up to constants? Sorry. Uh, you stated an upper bound on the previous. Uh, let me just go back. Good. So the lower bound is log, you know, this is the lower bound, pretty much. Not the log f? And the up, uh, and separately log f. I don't know how to multiply these two things together and get it, you know, universal lower bound. Yep. Good. Probably can be done. I don't know how to do it. OK. Uh, so I'll, you know, pretty much telling you the challenges. You know, this is the lower bound. I want an upper bound which matches this up to this log f factor, maybe. How do I do that? Uh, of course, I don't know how to solve the math program. Because the math program has these mu's, and I don't know the mu's. Okay, of course, I'm going to guess and double, right? Uh, and this collection f may be large, so I don't know how to solve this in polynomial time. And that I can't do in general, but I can do it for special cases. Okay. So uh, basically, you know, this is the one thing. It's, it's a, it, there's a lot of stuff here, but I'm just giving you a general idea of what the algorithm looks like. And the algorithm is, and the log f should give you an idea. The algorithm is going to eliminate suboptimal solutions. Not a polytime algorithm, clearly. So what do you do? There's some mess. If you only have one candidate remaining, you should make sure that it's good. You do some verification step. Otherwise, uh, in this iteration, you're going to remove all the guys who are some epsilon r away from the optimum. <coughs> How? You solve a convex program with this guess of epsilon r. You sample things accordingly. And you get rid of all the suboptimal solutions. At a very high level, the idea is very simple. Uh, there's some details, but this is, you know, if you, if you take this and you think about it, you should be almost much of the way there. OK. Uh, let's say LP. Uh, maybe I'll stop. It, with uh, just mentioning this, the, the general problem. Um, OK, so the general problem is the following. I have uh, Rn. I'm giving you a, uh, a set of disjoint regions. And what I want to figure out is I want to figure out the region that contains the mean vector. How many samples do you need for this? So uh, you can write down a lower bound. And the lower bound, again, looks like pretty much this previous one. 
because that was so general, you can come up with this. And the upper bound we know, and this is, you know, this is annoying. There's a annoying n cube term out here. And this is the sort of, you know, this is the one that bothers me the most. This n, you know, some n term needs to be lost, but I don't know whether I need so many samples. So what a, what a big delta and little delta? Ah, okay. So uh, little delta is the confidence. So I want to output something with probability one minus delta. Uh, big delta is how far the mean vector actually lies from the boundary of one of these regions. Because if it's very close to the boundary, I would need something like this to get over that problem. So that's pretty much uh, what we know. I don't know a better lower bound. I'd love, uh, if, uh, I'd love it if somebody solved this problem. But uh, that's pretty much uh, all I have today. We talked about these, uh, you know, a variety of problems, maybe too many, but uh, hopefully uh, some of these are interesting. You know, uh, there are natural uh, questions all over the place. Better bounds, efficient algorithms. So I don't know efficient algorithms for many of these settings. And in general, you know, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, optimization problems that we like to solve. If the data is uncertain, how many samples do I need to solve my problem? I'd love to be able to answer this in much more generality than I do right now. And uh, that's pretty much all I have, guys. Thank you. Naive, but when you, the the last problem that you uh -huh. have is in Q, uh, try to do some kind of divide and conquer where you take unions of these things. Possibly, possibly. Yeah, I maybe. Like, you know, you take the union of half of them and half of the other. Uh huh. And you just want to decide if it's in that half or this half. Right. Ah, so, right. uh, so n is the dimension of the space. It's not the number of these little pieces out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So out here, the dependence was not on the. It's the dimension. Of the it's the dimension of the space. So are the top k versions of the combinatorial problem? Does that make any sense? Maybe. Uh, if the answer is no, then that's fine. Maybe I haven't thought about this at all. Okay. So they might make perfect sense. I just haven't thought about them. So I have a question. When you introduce the um, median algorithm, mm -hmm. you uh, actually you don't compare everyone to the top one, uh, and then when you actually implement it for the combinatorial case, you uh -huh. actually do this. So you must be losing somehow. Uh, uh, is there is there an obvious hurdle uh, in implementing the median approach to uh, the combinatorial structure? Yeah. So one of the things with the sort of median ones is there was this very nice threshold I could come up with in some sense, and I knew that the number of people who go above should be small and things like this. But with matroid structures, it could be that all the really interesting things are sitting down below. So just a single threshold is not quite the right answer. And uh, maybe you know, this, this sampled tree is implicitly giving us a threshold for every particular edge. But that's kind of vague. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe just a comment. It's the n cube. You can trivially replace it by n times log 1 over delta. Uh, Maybe. I don't know. Every coordinate you sample it uh, low, low of uh, C times log 1 over delta. Uh, log 1 over, it's sort of capital delta. No. Uh, you, delta is your confidence. De delta is my confidence. Oh, you see, using just the trivial sampling approach. Possibly. Possibly, yeah. I mean, I mean it sounds about right. It's still, it's still very interesting. But right. Uh, right. Not just not be there. Absolutely. But that's a good point. All right, so we're a bit over time, so it's the end for today. So